in Philadelphia. We're out of time. Just a few considerations since we're running a bit a little bit late. Letting the father know he goes to men. You know, we're now we're in a, the beginning of the time of the persecution of the church, and that there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, we have a common practice, even when we do a burial, whenever there's a ceremony that we do, that when we sprinkle the body, we sprinkle the body, and we say, Pater Noster. But then we don't say the rest of the prayer out loud. It's called the Disciplinum Arcane, the discipline of the secret. That we are reminded that in every age of the history of the church, there will always be a persecuted church. And so we say the Our Father, and then the priest in silence goes around and sprinkles the dead body. And he then goes around with incense, and incense is the dead body. But the people are still praying. And they're praying, Our who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they're saying those prayers, the remainder of the Our Father, in complete silence. And the very conclusion is then brought up out loud. At Nenos, in Dukas, and Tatsia, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And all the words in between are said in silence, and this is done multiple times when we do an anointing, when sometimes we do the Holy Communion. There are multiple times of the sick. There are times in which we say the Our Father out loud, Our Father, who art in heaven, in silence. In the remembrance that there are church, there is always a persecuted church somewhere. And even in the state of the persecuted church, where the priest is not able to celebrate the Holy Mass because he's locked in prison, or the, the, the faithful are not able to attend the Holy Sacrifice because they're in the catacombs, or if they do have Mass, it's like in the catacombs. These are our new catacombs today, having Mass in people's houses and funeral homes and hotels and all the places where we've had the Mass in the last 60 years since Vatican II, preserving this Holy Mass in the hidden places throughout the world. And now here it is, it comes back to this again, and we're in this time. But the church is going to always be persecuted. But in the time of the persecution of the church, we must persevere in the faith. And remember also, there will come a time of temptation. We're experiencing right now the temptation of St. Joan of Arc. Joan of Arc is a great saint of our times, Joan the Maid. And Joan the Maid, she never learned how to read. She had never, ever learned how to read. But what did she do? She had the visions. We have a beautiful consideration of her trial. They asked her, how old are you? And she held her fingers and said, 19, I think. She wasn't sure how old she was. She was not sure how to read. But she knew one thing. Jesus Christ is God, and the Saint Michael and other saints spoke with her, was going to win a war and defeat the English and drive the Catholic English out of France. Remember, they were Catholic at the time. She did not understand why. She did not know that 150 years later, less than 200 years after her death, England would become Protestant. And had she not driven the English out of France, France would have also become Protestant. At the time, it was Catholics fighting Catholics, the good guys against the good guys, and they did not understand what is it that God wants. But she knew this. I must live according to the voices that God spoke inside of me and the saints spoke inside of me, and I must follow these voices. And she also knew that in the great battle, there are wisdom, wise things to do. And one day, they, we attacked the city of, 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 uh, in France, and the soldiers were worn out. And it was the end of the day, and they retreated from the city to prepare for battle the next day. And she said, attack again. And the wise, old, experienced soldiers said, our soldiers are tired. They can barely lift the sword. We had a great difficulty in our release, at least at least an attack. And if we attack again, our soldiers will be defeated and we will lose. We have taken counsel, and it is not wise for us to attack now. And Joan, the 18-year-old girl, said to her, said to them, You have taken your counsel. And I have taken mine. My counsel comes from St. Michael. 
And he is a lot, knows a lot more about war than you do. Therefore, charge. And these French generals, they were not so stupid like modern man. They weren't so stupid. We have a great experience. We fought many wars. And now a girl, 19 years old, says, I have a different counsel. And this girl speaks to Michael, the saint, the Michael, the greatest of all generals that ever was. You know what? My great plans and my great wisdom and my great experience, to heck with it. Throw it all away. If Joan the maid says charge, I charge. And they turn into all the soldiers, forget our wisdom, forget our exhaustion, forget the fact that we thought we almost lost the battle in this charge. The maid says, it's the time of a charge. There is a wise time to charge, according to the generals of the world. There is a wise time to build up your strength. St. Peter was very wise. He studied all the books about swords. He got swords for dummies, how to use swords. He got he, 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 he checked on the internet. He knew all about military warfare. He was really good at video games. He won all his Warcraft and the Call of Duty and all of his different battles. He was an expert. He studied all the books. He was a priest, but that's what he did in his spare time. And he knew that when you go to war, what do you do? First thing you got to do is build up your strength. That's very important if you're going to go to war. You got to build up your strength. So he ate a big dinner. That's what he did. Another important thing if you go to war, make sure you always have your weapons with you. And always have a backup. He carried two swords. He even had the backing of Christ behind it. Because before they left that supper, what did our Lord say? Are there any swords here? Yes, Lord, we have two swords. And Christ said, it is enough. I got the backing of Christ. I got the writings right there. Christ said, it's enough. He said, two swords. Why do you think he wanted us to bring two swords? He thinks he just wants us just to carry the swords. He had two swords. He was ready. One broke, he had a backup. And then, of course, if you're going to fight, it's very important to rest. This is really important. He took a three-hour nap. He rested, and he rested, and he rested, and now the battle has come. He's ready for battle. How long did it last? Somewhere between two to five seconds. And then he fled the battlefield. And there are many, many soldiers today who are the followers of Jesus Christ. Many soldiers today that believe in the true faith, and they are ready for battle. They read the passage. You believe the passage says right there, are there swords here? Yeah, there are. It says it right there. Are there swords? We have two swords. It's enough. That means we don't need three. You better not be stuck with just one. You better have those two swords. We're going to go out in the battle. And so Peter will pray. The great Simon Peter, remember this about St. Simon Peter. He was not a coward. He was not. It's true that this night of Holy Thursday he would run away. But that's because there's a supernatural battle going on and a natural sword with a natural muscle and a natural hand and a guy who was really good with video games and a guy who really studied his catechism and the catechism of war, like an armchair quarterback there ever was. Maybe he knows a lot, but it is not enough on this day. It is not enough in this fight. What does Christ say? You're tired, Peter. Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And he fell asleep. Could you not watch one hour with me, Peter? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Now, it's interesting that on that night, our Lord Jesus Christ was tempted very greatly by the devil over three hours. And those apostles were tempted by the devil over about three minutes. He received such more temptation than they did. But what happened when the man Jesus Christ rose with a bloody sweat, and when he walked out toward to meet the mob, he was exhausted. He had drained all the all of the nutrients of the meal had gone out through his blood. He was in a total state of exhaustion. He was in pain from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. He could barely stand. 
He was already the man of sorrows, filled with blood, and this is before Judas gave him a kiss. This is no time to go to battle. Maybe not, unless you take the counsel of Joan the Maid. She had a different idea. I'm tired. I'm worn out. It was not a very successful day. And remember, St. Peter would learn also, Lord, I'm tired. I'm worn out. I did not have a very successful night. We fished all night. We caught nothing. We're next to the shore. There's people making noise. Fish don't like people. Fish don't like noise. The, whatever fish were here, they already left. He didn't realize that these fish were the great-great-grandfathers of the fish that would listen to St. Anthony's sermon. He didn't know that. And these fish were all surrounding the boat, listening to Christ, but their heads were beneath the waves. And then our Lord said, drop out that net for a great catch of fish. And there was a great catch of fish. We're in a battle now in which we must follow the wisdom of the saints and not the wisdom of the world. And we're in a battle now in which we have to say we're not going to follow the wisdom of the world, the wisdom of the wise counselors of our days. We must follow the counsel of the saints. We must follow the counsel of Joan the Maid. We must go to battle and charge. This is the time to be bold. This is the time to have confidence in the victory of Our Lady. This is the time to persevere. And what are they doing? They're closing the churches. And they don't have confidence anymore. And they were going to all be obedient. We're going to be so obedient and they haven't even pulled guns on us yet. Because after all, if we make them angry, then, then they're going to make the religion illegal. They could close our churches permanently. What did our wise warrior, a great bishop, Athanasius, say 1,700 years ago? They closed his church, and he was a bishop. He had to hide and live in a well for several years. He was exiled five different times, excommunicated three times by the Pope. By the Pope himself. And the Pope named him by name. And the Pope said, I hate you, Athanasius. And I am friends with the Arians. And he put it in writing. Then they sent it out to the whole world. Pope Liberius hates Athanasius. Athanasius is disobedient. What did Athanasius say? They have the churches. We have the faith. Let them have their churches. We don't need them. We can build new ones. We will have the faith. Our ancestors had no churches. St. Peter was the first pope and the greatest pope. He never said mass in a church once in his life. If you showed St. Peter a picture of a Catholic church, he would say, it's interesting. Well, what's that? Well, that's a, that's a church. Oh, that's nice. Where is it? He never saw a church in his life. He said mass in people's houses. He said Mass in the catacombs. He said Mass in prison. He went from house to house and was had to sneak from place to place. And he was the head of our holy church. And he ruled the entire earth from a catacomb. He was the representative of God. And whoever is his successor sits upon his chair. And the wise St. Bernard, he had a bishop who became Innocent II, Innocent the. 10th or something, whichever innocent he became, one of the innocent popes, there's about 13 or 14 of them. And one of them was a, a monk of St. Bernard of Clairvaux. And St. Bernard loved him. And he said, I know you're going to go to Rome because now you're a cardinal, and you're going to, but you're never going to return from Rome. I'll never see you again. Well, why not? Because you're going to be elected pope. Well, you're crazy. No, you're going to be elected pope. But well, let me tell you something. When you go to the conclave, you like the Pope, remember, you are the descendant of a fisherman. You're not one who sits on a great throne, because Rome is beautiful now, and they think they have great power. You're the descendant of a fisherman. Don't forget that. You are a shepherd, a descendant of Abraham. You are a fisherman, a descendant of St. Peter. You are not made to sit in golden chairs. You are not made to sit on a golden throne and to rule the world from the most beautiful place, which is the old St. Peter's that will be destroyed by a pope later on. No, you are a descendant of a, of a fisherman, and you are made for faith. 
You are made to spread that faith to the ends of the earth. That's what you're made for. Don't forget that. And so we have many churches, and we want to have our churches back. We want to have Mass in front of that beautiful high altar again. This is the temptation of so many Catholics who have tradition the last years. When I was a priest 26 years ago, 20, whatever it is, 1994, do the math. When I was ordained a priest, I remember being ordained a priest and thinking, I wonder if I'll ever say Mass in a real church. I'm a priest of the Society of St. Pius X. We say Mass in barns. We say Mass in hotels. We say Mass in people's houses. We say Mass in funeral homes. And we have some churches that we built, which is somebody took a red barn and they put an altar in the front, some matching candlesticks. We think it's really nice. But an actual church that was built before Vatican II with the beautiful pews and the nice altar and the big high altar and the statues, will I ever in my entire priesthood ever celebrate a Mass in such a church? I don't know. Maybe I never will. But I will celebrate the Mass that St. Peter celebrated. And he never celebrated Mass in a church. None of the twelve apostles did except St. Thomas, because he was an architect. He built churches. St. Thomas celebrated Mass in church. He built them. One of his churches still stands 2,000 years later. And I was able to celebrate Mass in one of the places where St. Thomas used to celebrate Mass in India, in a cave where he lived. One of the twelve apostles lived in a cave, and he went around and said the Mass for people in their homes and so on. I will celebrate the Mass of the last 2,000 years. I will teach the faith of the last 2,000 years. Maybe I'll never see Mass in a real church. Maybe I will. I don't know. But I do know this. All that matters is that I must be faithful to the true Mass. I must be faithful to the true faith. And I must be ready to die for that holy faith. That is what matters. And to carry that faith to the very ends of the earth. That, that is what matters. Now what happens? You gave a great temptation. Now you can have your church. And this temptation was given to Joan the maid. St. Joan, a priest, was brought into her room carrying the blessed sacraments. Do you want to receive Holy Communion, dear Joan? Oh, yes, I do. We want to give you Holy Communion. We priests and bishops, two bishops and actually the become responsible for her death, and all priests. Her last days were spent only around priests and bishops. She didn't see any lay people. And they condemned her to death. And one of the priests came in, bringing the Holy Communion. Joan, I'm going to give you Holy Communion. And out came a piece of paper. There is the Blessed Sacrament. She so wants to receive Christ. And now came a piece of paper. You need to sign this recantation, Joan. You need to sign this paper paper that says you're a liar. You need to sign this piece of paper that says you not hear those voices. You need to sign this piece of paper, and then you can receive our Lord. I can't do it. And the priest turned and said, There, you, you are denying Christ. You don't want Christ. You're rejecting Christ. We wouldn't even let you go to Mass. You're rejecting the Mass. We have Mass every day. The true Mass. There was no new Mass back then. They were not heretics. You're rejecting the Mass. You're rejecting Holy Communion. You are of the devil. And then he told the priest, carrying the sacrament, to walk out. And Joan wept. But well, what would have happened had she received our Lord? She would have passed into eternal perdition. The Holy Communion was being used as a temptation. This is called the temptation under the appearance of good. You see, you can be approved now. We, our, my founder, Sister Fev, of our Society of St. Pius X, he shut down the Society of St. Pius X, said Paul VI, back in 1975. But all you have to do, say one new Mass. Just one. Only one new Mass, and you're approved. And just like that, we won't call you excommunicated anymore. That's in 75, way before 88. And you're, and you're going to be able to open parishes, seminaries, and all kinds of dioceses. You only have to say one new Mass. And our of have said, no. And the society continued to grow. In 1988, Pope John Paul II sent a limousine to Econs, Switzerland. The night before the consecration of four bishops to save the Catholic priesthood. And he said, you know, we're going to excommunicate you. 
But I got a limo from Rome. Get in the limo. Come back down. And we're going to sign the papers. Everything's going to be fine. We're going to give you a bishop. Everything you want. He said, no. As it says in Acts chapter 5, we obey God rather than man. And the time will come when we shall be vindicated, as was St. Athanasius, as was St. Bernard, as was St. Athanasius, Saint, Saint, uh, uh, the St. Alphonsus de Gouria, after he was expelled from the, from the order he founded, the Redemptorist, as was St. Francis and so many others. What is it that's going to win the war against Satan? What's going to win the war against modernism? What's going to win the war against this modern wickedness going on in our holy church? The true and holy faith, which must be held in such a way that it is such a treasure that I never want to let go of it. Not even for the Mass. Not even for Holy Communion. Not even for the approval of Rome. Modernist Rome. Because my approval must come from God. How did they become martyrs, our ancestors, in the last 2,000 years? They became martyrs because authorities who had authority from God said, you must follow some kind of wickedness or we will put you to death. And they said, no. We accept the Holy Father, Pope Francis is the Holy Father, but we cannot obey his wicked commands. We accept our bishop in Philadelphia as our bishop. We don't accept his wicked commands. And so, because he has not fulfilled his responsibility of teaching the faith as he is supposed to teach it without compromise, he has not fulfilled his responsibility of giving Christ as he's supposed to be given. Imagine now, in the modern wicked church, if one wimpy bishop, Bishop Wimpybus Maximus, if Bishop Wimpybus Maximus stood up and said, we're keeping our churches open, and we're doing processions, and we're having more masses, and we are not going to shut down our church because of some stupid virus or because of some command of the foolish authorities. This is the time to come to God. And we're going to have mass right out in Grand Central Park. We're going to have mass on Fifth Avenue. Since you're number 70 traffic, all right, we'll block your snaking traffic. We're going to say mass right there. We are going to offer the mass publicly, and we're inviting all souls to come. Confessions are open, and we will be here. And if you want to arrest our priests, go ahead. Arrest them. You want to arrest our faithful? Go ahead. Arrest them. Our ancestors have been arrested for 2,000 years. We're familiar with that. But you won't do it. You won't do it at all. This is not the time for that. We are near the time of the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is our time. Let us have confidence in her victory. Keep our faith and not fall for the modern temptations under the appearance of good. Stay with the holy truth. <laughs> And live with it deeply in our hearts and never let it go. And God will bless us and preserve us through the most difficult of times. In close day, God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.